Good morning, my name is Zhou Chen, and I'm the manager of WISE. Um, welcome to Energy Day 2014. Um, uh, we're celebrating energy research today um, at the University of Waterloo, and um, I'm delighted to see um, a good mix of audience today. Um, we have students, um, faculties, um, business and industry leaders, and public sector representatives as well. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with WISE, we are at the uh, Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy at the University of Waterloo. We are sort of focal point of energy research on campus, and we have over 130 members um, whose expertise are drawn from uh, dozens of different disciplines spanning engineering, um, environment, science, um, applied health studies, math, and arts. Um, we work very closely as well um, with um, public sector, uh, private sector partners and um, government um, and civil society to really ground our work in real world issues around sustainability and sustainable energy. We have a morning of, of events planned for you. Um, we have two exciting panels, uh, one focusing on energy entrepreneurship, uh, which will start in a minute, and uh, the other one focusing on uh, the future of energy service delivery, which will uh, start um, at uh, 11 o'clock. And we have a um, networking session um, in between these two panel sessions where I would very much encourage you to check out the uh, posters from uh, our students and uh, the displays from some of our student groups and regional organizations. Um, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce um, the moderator for um, the first uh, panel, uh, Dr. Paul Savani. Paul is the uh, CEO of the Accelerator Center. Um, the Accelerator Center is a world-renowned network of facilities in Waterloo dedicated to developing and commercializing technology startups. And uh, Paul is a seasoned executive with experience in going highly profitable, um, world-class technology companies. He uh, previously, previously served as Chief Technology Officer at Christie Digital, a uh, company that many of you might be familiar with, where he uh, guided the company's global research and innovation strategy. Um, prior to Christie, he was CEO at Side Effects Software in Toronto, where he led an award-winning team of mathematicians and software developers in the creation of 3D animation and visual effects softwares for Hollywood feature films. Um, so I'll now hand the stage to Paul and uh, let him introduce the theme and the format of the first panel and the panelists. Very much. So great to be here. I gotta say, I was a little worried. I was a little worried. It's Oktoberfest, and you know, 9 a.m. panel, uh, not usually a good time, but uh, really glad to see everybody here. My two favorite topics today, uh, sadly, energy, not one of them, but research and entrepreneurship, and, uh, and how those two come together. And so I'm delighted to be able to be here today uh, and to talk about uh, those two topics uh, in the context of our first panel. We have three fantastic panelists, and what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce the panelists uh, one at a time. Then after I introduce them, they're going to come up and do about a seven-minute presentation. Precisely, right? Uh -huh, yeah. And then uh, after the three panelists have done, uh, we'll take about uh, 20 minutes at the end for uh, questions and answers from the audience. We'll bring people up so they can, uh, they can get together. So today we're going to hear a lot about energy entrepreneurship, and I think what's so exciting about the field of energy entrepreneurship is it takes so many different forms, from very small capital light uh, companies to very large capital intensive companies. And so part of what we'll talk about today is what's unique about being an entrepreneur in the energy space. And I think a great way to do that is to start with our uh, serial entrepreneur here, uh, Ian McClellan. Now, sometimes when people talk about being serial entrepreneurs, it means they've had two companies, and uh, Ian's going to shame us with uh, a, uh, an endless list here. It's pretty impressive. So, Ian is the president and CEO of Ubiquity Solar, and he's worked for, created, or built significant technology and photovoltaic technology companies for over 30 years. He led or co-led over 300 million in debt, equity, and government grant financing projects, He's a Ryerson University grad in electrical engineering technology, and he's worked for or consulted to Straight Gain Electronics, Motorola, Hewlett Packard, Oracle, Pachnia Industries, Solar Design and Advanced Energy, and he's co-founded IC Engineering, Creation Venture Capital, Cyrus Systems, Creation Studios, Creation Technologies, Arise Technologies, and now Ubiquity Solar. Ian, slow down, you're making us look bad. 
All right, Ian, over to you. The, uh, the trend, um, a major trend, and then as an entrepreneur, how am I positioning our company to go after uh, our, our market? And so we're involved uh, in, the, in the materials part of the uh, uh, value chain. Uh, solar has gone from about a $2 billion industry in 2000 to over $100 billion uh, last year. Uh, and when you have an industry growing that quickly, it typically segments into materials, uh, fabrication and services, and we're involved in the materials part of the equation. Um, I, I won't get into too much about the technology, but basically we're involved with polysilicon and wafers, which is the foundation materials for the people involved in fabrication, uh, which then is installed by people that do systems from a services standpoint. So this is the ultimate big picture. I think it's interesting because 15 years ago in this room, Joachim Luther from Fraunhofer Institute put a slide like this up here. And I, I've been following it ever since. So, oh, back, back, back. Um, so, in 1997, this is the PV industry. And this is the world energy right here, growing about 1% per year. This is what's happened over the last 15 years. And we've been growing at 38% over a 20-year period. So, what you're seeing here is, why won't it just go there? And that's 100% of the world energy in 20 years. Now, 20 years ago, I hooked up the internet in my home office, and my friends came by because they had never seen the internet before. They had heard about the internet, but they hadn't seen it. This is what we're going to see happen here. This is happening faster than I thought it would, faster than anybody else. And we're going to see a fundamental shift on how we do energy on the planet. Now. <clears throat> When I joined Hewlett Packard in 1981, so I'm the old guy in the room now, I don't know how that happened, but anyhow, uh, <laughs> Chuck House, who's the director of engineering at HP, gave a presentation on the future of computers. And he talked about how computers were going to cost a dollar a MIP in the year 2000. In 1981, there were a million dollars a MIP. So to go from a million to a, a dollar was pretty amazing. And he talked about how Gordon Moore put semiconductors on a log-log curve and made that prediction. And that's now popularized as Moore's uh, law. So in, and by the way, in the year 2000, if you bought a Pentium 3 computer running at 600 megahertz, it was a 2000 machine that you could buy for $2,000. Bang right on. So the lesson I learned, never bet against an experience curve. So with that, um, in 97, 97 um, laser pointer, I started plotting this. And uh, I figured out how to use the log log function in Excel. And I was busy uh, plotting these. And in 2003, um, I was leading a company called Arise Technology. We're the Canadian distributor. And we were buying modules for $3 a watt. And I said, you know, I bet I'll be able to buy them for uh, $2.86 by the end of the year. And I was buying them for $2.85. And I thought, boy, am I brilliant. This is, this is great. Uh, I can predict the future. Uh, and then what happened is there's this giant sucking sound out of Germany. Uh, and, and we couldn't buy any product. And what happened is prices went up. But the key thing about an experience curve is there's a difference between cost and price. Price is very easy to uh, measure. Cost is much more difficult. And so, w but that creates extraordinary profits. Costs continue to come down. And so what happened in this period is there was a bubble. And in this period right here, investment banks woke up and said, you solar guys are making an awful lot of money. How would you like an awful lot more? And so uh, I thought I was brilliant again, but I wasn't. Uh, we went out and raised $105 million in a bubble. And then we went off and built a factory in Germany. And prices continue to come down. But look at the space between that. Look at the growth. We're looking at over 100% growth right here. And then about right here, I was in my 
office in Germany with my fancy new 50 million euro solar cell factory. And I said, I haven't been putting stuff into my Excel curve lately. And then I went, I started plotting this. And I went, uh-oh. If this snaps back to the experience curve, we're dead. And that's what happened. And so never ignore an experience curve. It cost me millions, <laughs> literally. So don't do that. So here's what's happening here. Now, going back to this previous curve, why won't that happen? Well, I, don't think, I think it's something like this is going to happen, and it's probably going to happen sooner than this. So imagine the implication of free energy on this planet. And what does this do to everything? And we've seen this with the internet because basically now we have free information to everybody. And so if you want to, as an entrepreneur, you, if you want to figure out how to make an awful lot of money, figure out how to make something free for everybody, but figure out how to make money doing that. So where we're going is this continues to go down like this. So this point right here is the same point as the other graph where we hit 100%. Well, here we have modules being installed at 15 cents a watt. We obsolete conventional energy because solar is by far the cheapest. That's where we're going, and it's happening faster than anybody thought. Now, it's also going to be a bit rocky, and this is why I call this the solar coaster. Uh, so hold on to your hats. It's a, it's a scary but very exciting ride. Um, but anyhow, uh, so that's, that's the big picture. So what's happening is, uh, from a technical standpoint, this is a bit... Uh, uh, busy, but uh, what's driving our industry is efficiency. Um, and what we've seen is prices have come down, but this is an efficiency curve here. And back in 2008, if you extrapolated this curve, um, down at 0% efficiency, uh, you have to discount your product. But right now, at 8% at efficiency, it has to be zero. So if you're working on a low cost strategy, but low efficiency, um, if it's less than 8%, you have to sell your product for zero. But you can't make it for zero, so that's probably a bad strategy. Um, so what we're doing is we're focusing on high efficiency. And uh, this is the PV market. This is the electronics market. They're merging together. And we've identified this market right here, uh, which nobody is doing, but it drives efficiency. Uh, and that allows us to um, um, uh, grow very quickly, uh, and we have some proprietary technology which creates a little brick wall there, uh, and it's a classic disruptive technology. We take technology that's useful here, you simplify it, reduce the cost, and go after a higher volume market. So if you take a look at uh, Clayton Christensen and disruptive tech in the dilemma, this is a classic technology strategy. So last slide, this is, we've put together a strong uh, team working uh, with the University of Waterloo down here, um, and, um, and through a couple other universities, Fraunhofer and ECN, and put together a, a strong team. So as an entrepreneur, the most important thing that I would recommend is you have to have a strong team. And that's what I'm doing. Thanks. Thank you very, very much. Uh, fascinating. and. Uh, Next speaker, now I always think if you can get people talking about you, uh, you know, in a strange way, that's usually a good thing. And when I introduce Matt, when, when I talk about Matt to other people, they always say, the stealth snowmobile guy. That's a pretty cool thing to be known for. So, Matt Stevens, CEO of CrossChasm, co founder and CEO, a company that created Fleet Karma and My Karma. He's been involved in the design of over 20 hybrid and electric vehicles ranging from lunar rovers to stealth snowmobiles. And uh, he now works on making personal fuel economy labels for fleets and individuals looking to pick the best green vehicle for them. Matt holds a PhD in chemical engineering, was named to Waterloo Region's top 40 under 40, is an adjunct professor here at the University of Waterloo, and is past chairman of Electric Mobility Canada. Matt. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Paul. So hi everyone, uh, when we had the call to prep for today, being a Waterloo spin-off and also a graduate of the Accelerator Center, um, it really was an honor to be invited to be part of this. And Paul asked me, he said, 
if batteries get 20% cheaper or 30% cheaper, will the EV industry go on fire? And I thought it was a really relevant question. It's one I get a lot. And I said, that's what I would like to talk about today. And that's about something I learned at the Accelerator Center because my quick answer to you is no, it won't go on fire. And I'm gonna tell you that in three really quick stories. I got seven minutes. I'm gonna talk about the circles. I'm gonna talk about the kinetics and I'm gonna talk about the opportunity. So, when I was a grad student at Waterloo, this is how I thought the world worked. Um, I thought technology, I sort of had the field of dreams view of technology. You build great technology and money will come. Technology is immediately a product, a product is immediately a company. Thank you very much, problem solved. Mic drop, right? Uh, what I quickly learned through, well, through multiple years at the Accelerator Center and, and starting our company is this is actually how it is. The reality is technology is a very small part of what makes a product and actually what makes a company. And if you dig into it, there's a bunch of things like product positioning, customer education, something called the pricing model, a whole lot of things that actually turn a technology into a usable product, including support documentation. And then a company includes sales process, distribution networks, and a whole bunch of host of other things. And so when we talk about how could uh, sustainable energy thrive, I wanna make sure that we don't just focus on that little gray dot, because I think being in an academic environment, that's where we spend a lot of time focusing, and you're missing some fantastic opportunities. So that's seed number one, is that technology wants to be a narcissist, but it's really only a small part of the solution. So two is kinetics. So this is the lab I used to work in when I had a lot more hair. That's a fuel cell tester. That's Dr. Fowler, my supervisor. This is the lab I spend most of my time in now. I spend more than half my time in car dealerships, seeing what do people actually sign on the dotted line? And can you actually get them to change their behavior? And Eric, my colleague, this is, you can't really see it, this is a fleet garage. He just spends his time in a similar role working with fleets to figure out how are they buying or not buying fuel efficient technologies. And what I've come to learn is that selling plugins is very similar to freezing a lake and chemical engineering, mainly because I wanted to make that work. So, you know, this is a lake, it's minus, I, I originally made this slide for a US audience, but I put metric in there too. But that's, that's, that's open water. And the question is, why isn't that frozen? Hopefully everyone here agrees that at normal pressures, at minus 12, that should all be ice. And the reason is time, right? The recipe for making ice is you make it really cold and you wait. And that's basically what it is. And in chemical engineering terms, that's thermodynamics and kinetics. So my question is, when you think about car buying, is there a similar parallel? And there is. Thermodynamics is basically what percentage of people will an EV work for, and is it a financially smart decision? What is a theoretical optimum? And the kinetics is how many people are actually buying. So when you sort of look at the numbers, again, we're all about personal fuel economy labels, so it's really hard to make general statements, but we tried to. And we said, okay, well, when we look at everyone's drive cycle, how many people, given the EVs that are on the market today, do the vehicle not work for because of range, seats, payload? It's about 60%. It's over half right now. But then if you look at the remaining 40%, about 18%, not only can the EV do the job, and I'll move over so these people can see it, but it's actually the most cost-effective option. Anyone here know what the average rate of plug-in sales is? So that's if you include hybrids, which is a good point. If you actually look at plug-in hybrids, and sorry, every year more of this bucket's gonna move in there, and as the batteries become cheaper, more people are gonna move to blue. But if you actually look what plug-in vehicle sales are, it's about 0.67%. And that, that's North America, and the US is kicking our butt. Their adoption rate is about five times ours. So we like to think we're all green. As far as plug-ins are concerned, we are being left in the dust. But anyway, what this says is that for 18% of people, plug-ins will do the job, and they're financially smart, and less than 1% are buying. So my message is pretty clear, EVs have a kinetics problem. The thermodynamics will get better, but the kinetics suck. So, now what's the opportunity? So again, so the company that you know, I'm part of is called CrossChasm. Some people know us as Fleet Karma, some people know us as My Karma. It's because I was in charge of marketing for a very brief time and I decided to segment three brands, but basically, Crosschasm works with OEMs to make better vehicles. So that's helping with the stealth snowmobiles to on-road vehicles. 
you know, Ford, GM, those guys. That's not where we spend most of our time anymore, and that's not where most of our future is. Most of our future is on this side in Fleet Karma and My Karma. And they're all about actually helping the end user navigate the kinetics problem. So this is actually the 14-step guide off the EPA website on how to read a fuel economy label. <laughs> it says you're going to get somewhere between 98 and 38 miles per gallon. PS, that's mile per gallon E, equivalent. So that's gallons of electricity. Does anyone know the going rate of a gallon of electricity? <laughs> Can you imagine going into a budget and saying, I'm going to spend somewhere between 38 million and 98 million. I'm not really sure. And it's not really 98 million. It's kind of 98 million. It's really hard for someone to navigate that. So I'm going to get you to buy a car right now. You're Derek. Derek is Sonny on our team's dad. Um, Drives 22 and a half thousand miles, so that's about 37,000 kilometers, more than the average person, a bit of a lead foot. I'm going to give you two options. Who's going to buy A? Show of hands. It's interactive, you got to vote. Who's going to buy B? Good, because I chose red. So, <laughs> now I'm going to give you two options, and I'm going to move up just so people can see. A at 19,000 or B at 26,000. But I'm telling you, B is more efficient. Who's willing to put seven grand on the line? Who's going A? The cheaper one, who's being saved? Who's going B? So we got about two thirds went with A. What if I change the information? I say, hey, here's the liters per 100 kilometers. This is the sticker value. This is you know, that thing that the government says you're going to get that's on the window. Who's going A? Who's going B? About the same, maybe a little bit more. What if I say this? 597 for A, 592 for B. Who wants to go A? <laughs> Who wants to go B? What if I actually say, you know what, on top of that, car B has more horsepower, more torque, heated seats, heated mirrors, nicer wheels, fog lights, Bluetooth, better audio, better brakes, voice control, wireless tire pressure, and remote start. Who hates heated seats so much they want to pay five bucks more? Who's going for A? <laughs> One person. This is an actual option. This is an actual report, an actual option. We data logged Derek, and this was hidden numbers. He could buy the cruise gas for $5.97 a month or the cruise diesel, get all that stuff and save five bucks a month and have higher resale value. So let's throw in a vol. Again, 19, 26, 35. Who's ready to make that leap? What about if we look at monthly numbers? Who wants to spend $5.27? I own a Volt. I can tell you it's a much nicer vehicle. So you saw we moved from two thirds of the people here choosing A everyone but one person choosing B, and we didn't change the technology. We didn't change the technology. Technology is not a product. Product includes customer education. All we did was give you more information. We made it personal and simple, and we got two thirds of the room to change their purchase decision. So within CrossGasm, we do other stuff. We, this is a Fleet Karma logger. All we do with Fleet Karma electric vehicle monitoring is we get access to signals that are on the vehicle that other people can't get. Nothing rocket science about it, we just expose signals that are really hard to get, like state of charge and electric monitoring. But the thing is, if you're a fleet and you're rolling EVs into your fleet and you're having drivers come back saying, I have no range when I'm coming back, I'm almost stuck by the side, when we can go in the data and say, well, you know, it's 17 degrees out and you were cranking the heat and you were driving like a lead foot. Let's work a few things. Let's, let's, let's preheat the cabin. We'll still make it 38 degrees in that cabin. We're just going to preheat it for you. And then you're going to come home with a bunch of range, right? Again, not rocket science. All we're doing is unlocking some information to make it the EV ownership easier. And you get pretty reports about when you're charging and when you're loading on the grid. And one of the things, because I do want to bring this up, because I was in a meeting the other day and uh, we're getting more in because we put these devices on EVs after you buy, so we help you figure out if you should buy, and then if you buy an EV, we'll put those devices after, and we're getting more and more into smart charging, which is basically, we'll turn off a bunch of charging when the utilities really need it. So it's sort of like the thermostat program, if you're familiar with PeakSaver. Um, but the meeting I had said, the OEMs are working on their own system of this, it's called Central Server. How will you guys possibly compete? It's a good point. The central server is a much technically superior solution. I have no technical advantage other than 
that's not coming out for a few years. And when I was at a meeting with Google, who's really needing smart charging right now because they're having a massive issue with employee charging, and I say, and they said, well, that solution's coming out in five to seven years, which as far as they're concerned is never. That's beyond the horizon of existence as far as they're concerned. <laughs> right? That's where this matters. So my message to you is there's value and speed. And I don't know where this is going to play out, but what I wish, what I was going through grad school that someone told to me is that technology isn't everything. There's a lot of other things that matter, including customer education and speed. So with that, hopefully I planted the seed that don't just look at the gray. You're going to miss a lot of things. Because what you may not have pulled, but I'll just reiterate right now, where our future is with CrossChasm is on the orange. We have a number of PhDs and masters on our team. And what we focus on is, where is the technology not enough? Like, where can we use really fancy, sophisticated, predictive modeling techniques to just tell you how much you're going to spend a month in gas? Because we can make a huge difference of it, and dealerships will pay us for it, and utilities will pay us for it. And the greatest thing is, we're now seeing an increase of 9% of fuel efficiency. We are moving the needle by 9% by doing nothing more than giving people better information. So hopefully I've planted a few seeds, and that's my time. Thanks. Matt, awesome, as always. Uh, we are so thrilled to have you here at the university, but also that you've chosen to use your skills for good and not evil. <laughs> Next speaker is Hamid al Mohammed, the founder of AOMS Technology. Hamid holds a PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Waterloo. He has over 11 years of experience in measurement systems and instrumentation, oil and gas, automotive, and aerospace industries. He's worked for and consulted to several early stage startups and is co-inventor of patents on optical fiber sensing technology. His innovations in optical fiber sensors led to the formation of AOMS Technologies, a Waterloo-based startup developing optical fiber monitoring systems for harsh environments. He's received industrial R&D and commercialization awards from NSERC, OCE, and the Ontario Ministry of Economic Development and Innovation. Hamid. Thanks for the introduction. So my uh, talk is a little bit different than the other two talks. They were all about like uh, green energy, but mine is like about the another part of the, the energy sector, which is oil and gas, which is not green, but it's a significant portion of the energy and we have to address that. Um, this graph is very similar to the graph that uh, Jan showed. Um, this is a graph published by Shell and it shows the uh, global energy demand in the next uh, 40 uh, to 50 years, up to 2050. And as we see there, uh, we have a huge growth in the, uh, or, or we need a huge demand in the, in, the oil, in the energy in the world. And the main reason for that is that developing countries like China and India, they are in their um, most energy intensive uh, time because of their economic growth and because they are going to that into, uh, to a, a, an industrialization phase, and also they are gonna build infrastructure, they're gonna use transportation a lot, and we'll see this huge growth. And the, uh, the current initiatives on using green energy, which is very fantastic, but uh, it cannot offset the, uh, this growth, at least for the next 40 years. And as we see there, the, uh, green, the, the yellow and the red uh, 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 regions, they show the oil and gas. So you see that at least 50% of the uh, world energy needs to be supplied by oil and gas. And still oil and gas is a major um, uh, part of the, uh, the story. And uh, we know that oil and gas is not a green energy. And we are using a lot of resources. Uh, we are damaging our environment because of using that. So when we talk about oil and gas, there are two different, like uh, we can categorize it basically in two different uh, segments, the conventional oil and gas and unconventional oil and gas resources. So conventional is like, uh, like oil wells that we are all familiar with that, but unconventional ones are the, uh, very, uh, like, like the oil and gas resources that are very hard to extract. And most of them are in North America, basically our Canadian uh, uh, oil sands and also the, uh, the US shale gas. And there is an initiative to make North America energy independent. Basically, the reason for that is that 
North America, because of many political and economic uh, reasons, wants to be independent of the energy from outside the continent. Basically, they don't want to rely on purchasing oil and gas from uh, North, uh, South America, Middle East, and all other countries. And for the, to, to make that happen, and because the oil and gas is still a major source of energy, they have to rely on two major sources of oil and gas, the Canadian oil sands and the U.S. shale gas, which is our, the, the major uh, source of energy for, for North America. So if you look at the, some numbers, Canada is the third largest, uh, it has the third largest recovered crude oil reserves in the world, and it's in the form of oil sands in Alberta. U.S. has the uh, fifth largest natural gas reserve in the world, and uh, that's all uh, called uh, shale gas. But these two sources of energy are all unconventional sources of energy, and they need very sophisticated processes to extract, but if we need them, we have to, we have to extract them, because if we want to be independent, we have to do that. And if you look at like, like the electricity generation in, uh, in North America, uh, like we use the, uh, the, the most of like the, the energy that we extract from, uh, from oil and gas to produce electricity. So Canada is good. We are using a lot of hydroelectric uh, power to generate electricity. But US, a lot of ener uh, like, uh, uh, a big percentage of the electricity generation is, uh, is by fossil fuels. And there is a huge issue related to greenhouse gas emission and all those like environmental issues that we are all familiar with that. And when it goes back to the issues in the energy sector, we can uh, like categorize the energy sector into three different segments, the production, transportation, and consumption. Actually, in the production, we are using f fossil fuels to extract more gas and oil from, from, from environment. And we are actually creating greenhouse gas to create a, a something that will generate greenhouse at the end. And this is a, this is a major issue in the, in the oil and gas industry. And the, the oil and gas producers are facing a lot of issues in terms of the cost because they have to keep, keep their costs low in order to meet the global uh, oil process. The efficiency, one of the major issues with the oil and gas industry, especially the unconventional ones, is the efficiency to get the most out of a single oil well instead of just uh, before they, they, they leave the well. And a lot of like environmental uh, regulations, they have to meet a lot of environmental regulations. For example, in Alberta, they have to use uh, huge amounts of water to extract the old sands. And there are a lot of like, um, regulations in, in, in the province of Alberta and impo also imposed by the federal government to reduce the amount of water that we use to extract uh, the, um, the energy, uh, the, the oil and gas, uh, basically uh, the, 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 um, the oil sands. In the transportation side, so we have uh, like pipelines all over the, uh, the world, especially in, in North America. And, transport, uh, and they're very strategic because they are very prone to a lot of like disasters, environmental disasters, and also um, some uh, safety and security issues, so they need to be protected. When it comes to the consumption, it's all the, cons uh, the, uh, the uh, basically the, the, the people that, uh, that use the energy. Again, cost is one issue. Uh, they, they have to pay for that energy. And then the energy that we use, we generate a greenhouse emission. Now, these are all the, like, like the issues that are related to the energy sector in different segments, production, transportation, and consumption. But how this can be uh, resolved or how we can mitigate all these issues? So one approach is an intelligent energy system. So having systems that we can monitor every uh, segment of the energy from production, transportation, distribution, and consumption. Basically, we, we monitor the oil wells. We monitor the oil wells during the production. We optimize the process in order to minimize the greenhouse gas emission, for example, or minimize the energy that we spend to extract uh, the, the, the oil and gas. For the transportation, uh, for example, in the pipelines, we need to have monitoring systems, the systems that, that can uh, monitor the, the, for example, pressure, leakage, and all these factors in the pipelines um, in order to make sure that the pipelines are, are safe and they are not causing any issue. And on the consumption side, again, uh, we can have monitoring systems to optimize, basically to monitor the, the, uh, the customer's behavior in uh, energy uh, uh, consumption and optimize the, uh, the way that we distribute the energy in order to increase the efficiency. As an example, here uh, what, what OHM's technology is involved is downhole monitoring system. These two pictures basically showing the oil sands production and shale gas uh, production in the US. So you see how the, 
uh, the process is done, basically they, they, they make two uh, horizontal wells and in one well they inject uh, high pressure steam and that the steam will uh, cause the, uh, the bitumen, which is the, the, the oil sands at a very high viscosity to, uh, to reduce its viscosity and it's pumped out to, to the surface. So we basically damage the underground by making all these wells. And in the, in the, in the U.S. shale gas uh, production, basically, uh, there is a, there, there's a mechanism called hydraulic fracturing. So the high pressure uh, uh, liquid is injected into the well and it creates cracks in the rocks and uh, the gas is, uh, j that, that is trapped in the, um, in the rocks will uh, penetrate into the cracks and it will be uh, transported to the surface. So all, if you look at both these processes, they are very, um, they are not environment friendly and there are a lot of like issues in terms of that. But Again, these are the, uh, the, the major sources of energy, at least for the next 40 years, and we have to think about it. So by optimizing this process, by having now the oil and gas industry, they need monitoring systems in order to monitor the, the wells so they can monitor the condition of the well and optimize the process in order to efficiently extract the, oil, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the gas or the oil from the well. And when it comes to uh, the, uh, the pipeline, so this picture shows the... Uh, the network of pop pipelines in, in North America. And pipelines are, are uh, as I mentioned, is very, uh, they're very strategic. So they are, uh, they, uh, any damage to a pipeline can have very catastrophic effects on the environment. So, and this, it can happen due to many reasons, environmental issues, uh, corrosion, uh, in, in failure in, in the mechanical integrity of the pipeline, and also vandalism and effect like terrorism and all those effects. So, uh, now the, the, uh, the transportation companies, which are, which are the, like a midstream uh, segment of the oil and gas industry, are relying on monitoring systems. They need monitoring systems in order to, to monitor all this network of oil and gas in order to safely transport the energy to, uh, to the customers. Uh, when it comes to the consumption, so as I mentioned, the, uh, the, uh, the energy that is extracted from oil and gas is, uh, is used to produce electricity. So what we can do on the, uh, on, the, uh, um, on the consumption side in order to uh, increase the efficiency and reduce the amount of energy that we, we spend, basically using the smart grids. And uh, that's one of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the approaches. We a modernized system using the digital and analog information systems in order to detect the, um, the amount of energy that is uh, spent and then optimizing the distribution process. And also, yeah, you, you, uh, you, you have heard of like all the systems, uh, like uh, sensor systems that we now install in, uh, in houses and residential areas and also in business um, uh, uh, buildings that they can monitor the energy consumptions in the, in the buildings. And also because um, uh, Matt also mentioned about the electric vehicles, so now with the growth of electric vehicles, we need more electricity to charge our cars. So that, again, that's, that's an, uh, uh, that, that we need to consume electricity. So how we can like, efficiently uh, monitor these things and how we can optimize this process is, 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 a, uh, is, is a challenge now. And now, these are all um, uh, areas for, uh, for, uh, for business and for commercialization, for, for innovation. Any monitoring system, from hardware to software, that can address all these issues is, uh, at least in Canada, there, is a, there, there are great opportunities for, for that. And now it's the best time for, uh, for Canadian companies to enter into this commercialization highway. So we, there are many reasons for that. So there are uh, like supports from the federal and uh, provincial government to, uh, for economic growth and job creation to support the startups. And um, there are, um, highly qualified personnel in Canada. We have a lot of universities in Canada. We are, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, students are graduating from master's and PhD in, in Canada and they're all smart people and they have a lot of ideas and they have that technology part of the, as Matt mentioned, the technology part of the, the commercialization, but now they need to move forward and go to the, to, to the other segments in order to sell that and uh, make the board better, basically. And now in Canada, it, it has changed for, 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 uh, uh, over the past years. So now the investment in high-tech industry is now, uh, is now a, a, a culture in Canada. It's now like, like U.S. And uh, we, we see a lot of like U.S. ventures, they come and invest in Canadian startups. This is a very uh, uh, fantastic uh, uh, thing that, that's happening now. And um, these are all the, the reasons that we have to go into that path in the commercialization path. And uh, now, as I mentioned about the supports that are available, uh, now we are entering a startup like uh, 
like century, I'll call it. Um, so these are all samples of like programs that are available uh, in, in Canada to support the entrepreneurship in, in, in many areas. And from OCE, there are a lot of programs, the brochure for commercialization, smart start entrepreneurship flow, uh, flow ships. The CYBA, which now it's the, the change name to Futurepreneur Canada. There are a lot of like programs, commercialization, for example, seed monies to start with, uh, uh, startups. And when they, 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 uh, they, the businesses grow, there are other programs like uh, IRAP NRC, and NRC IRAP, which is the Industrial Research Assistance Program, which can help uh, small, uh, small and medium-sized businesses to grow and take the ideas, uh, do R&D, and uh, uh, basically go to like, a, like, like, a, like R&D and commercialization phase. And the shred, which is, uh, I think everyone is familiar with that, it's a tax credit for R&D in Canada. So all these reasons, I mean, uh, I think are good reasons for us to, uh, to go into commercialization in Canada. Okay, thank you. So maybe I'll invite up, our, uh, invite up all of our panelists here to uh, have a seat here and we can take some questions from the audience. So uh, who would like to begin? Uh, go ahead, please. So how to uh, mix the PV and electronics in the marketing? Sure. Uh, what has happened is, on the material side of things, the production of polysilicon for both the electronics industry and the PV industry is by and large merged, in that the companies, you're producing the same material, similar material at the same plant. Now they have different recipes, uh, basically for PV, uh, it's uh, about an order of magnitude less pure, kind of 9N purity is the nomenclature, where electronics is at 10N. The difference is f for uh, PV, you just speed up the process and you don't handle it as carefully. Um, uh, and so the, the, the two industries by and large have merged. <coughs> Excuse me. In 2004, the electronics industry uh, uh, consumed 10 times the amount of silicon as what the PV industry did. Today, it's the exact opposite. The PV industry is consuming 10 times the silicon compared to the electronics industry. Basically, the electronics industry has been growing really slowly, and the PV industry has been growing very quickly. That is the result. Now, the, the electronic grade material is still much more expensive. Uh, and so from a, a wafer market standpoint, so you take your polysilicon and you turn it into a wafer, those two markets are roughly the same size. Um, they're both uh, about eight, uh, eight, nine billion dollars a year. So I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, question up here. So when you, when you introduce a green energy, do you need the same amount of power uh, in, in non-green energy? I'm just repeating the questions because uh, we're recording, and so uh, if we don't, we won't get the questions. So uh, go ahead, Ian. Well, if you take a look at uh, I, 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 the simple answer is no. Um, so what you're, you're getting at is the backup power. What do you do when the sun doesn't shine or when uh, you don't have the wind blowing? So in, uh, depending on the market, somewhere between uh, 10 uh, to 40 percent of your energy uh, getting from renewables, storage is not an issue at all. Uh, when you get past that point, then you have to have uh, ways to deal with the intermittency of the, the power, and that's either through distributed storage, centralized storage, or better transmission lines. Uh, if we take a look at, um, so we're still in that early stage of growth. Uh, so, for example, uh, in Europe, uh, solar is about 2.5% of the energy from last, uh, last year, so that's a drop in the bucket, so it's not an issue at all. Um, and uh, 
Uh, but we're also seeing in terms of new generating capacity, solar uh, is, is, is the fastest growing. So for example, in the second quarter of uh, 2014, 52 percent of all new generating capacity installed in the United States was solar. The last three years uh, in Europe, uh, solar and wind have been number one and number two. They've flipped back and forth a bit uh, in terms of new generating capacity. So right now at that early stage, it's not an issue at all, but I think as, as we get into that 10 to 40 percent range, uh, storage is going to become a much bigger issue. That's something we're watching very closely. We're very, one of the things we're interested in the medium term is uh, silicon lithium batteries. Basically, we're interested in anything to do with silicon. Uh, but they have about 10 times the energy density of the lithium ion battery. So I think that the storage issue will be solved uh, over the next decade. And just to extend on that, so there's, there's sort of three tools in the toolbox. One is have other generation that you can throttle up or down. And so that can be fossil, fossil or not. Um, there's other sources like nuclear, which maybe don't throttle as much, but they're really good base load. So there's other you can so you can throttle up and down generators. You can have storage, which Ian spoke to, or you can have load control. And so smart charging of EVs is one of those samples. So you need to be able to turn things on and off. So you have to turn generators on and off. You have to turn loads on and off, or you have to do storage. And the answer is going to be some some of those three. So uh, there was a, you know, Ian hinted at, uh, you know, a 10 times uh, increase in, in capacity being potential. So uh, the question is, where are we heading with respect to battery technology? Uh, and is that following Moore's law? And if not, why not? So, uh. so I was listening to an audiobook on my flight back yesterday, and there was the line of, this is why batteries don't follow Moore's law. So I'm glad I perfectly prepped for today. Um, and the argument that the author put forward is that Moore's law generally follows where things are getting smaller. So transistors got smaller, they use less energy, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, batteries can get smaller, but not at the same order of magnitude scale. You're not going to have a battery this big that's you know, 60 megawatts. Um, so that's, that's the author's argument for why it'll be linear growth, not logarithmic. Um, so that's their answer for that. And, and um, I would say from my background in battery chemistry, I would agree. Uh, it'll get better. It's gotten better every single year, but I don't see, uh, you know, a hockey stick curve on that. Um, why I don't, or so order mag two would definitely help. Every little bit helps. Every little bit moves more people onto that blue side. But uh, and the better thermodynamics you have, the more of a forcing pressure there is. Um, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of other issues why EVs aren't selling, and that includes the dealership experience. They're, they're, just customer education. So if all of a sudden batteries were one-tenth the cost they are today, we would absolutely see more sales than we're seeing now. Um, but I would say that my argument is, you know, that's not the primary bottleneck. And people say that battery cost is the primary bottleneck. And from being in car dealerships, I can tell you that I do not believe that that is the primary bottleneck. I think that also it's important to differentiate between an experience curve and Moore's Law. What, J what Gordon Moore did is he put semiconductors on an experience curve and determined that for every uh, 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 18 to 24 months, you double the, the capacity. Uh, wh what I did and what other people in the industry have done with PV is put PV on an experience curve. So every technology has an experience curve. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll double every 18 to 24 months. PV is doubling every seven to 10 years. Nuclear power, you put nuclear power on an experience curve, it actually has a, a negative slope. It keeps on going up in price. The more you install, the more expensive it gets for, for whatever reason. So uh, you take a battery technology and you take a, a lithium ion battery, there's gonna be an experience curve for that. Uh, and you take a different chemistry, that will have a different chemistry. Um, and if you take about like a silicon lithium battery, which there's some various issues to, to commercialize that, that will also have an experience curve, but the slope of that curve for each technology is different. 
the, the batteries are, the design of the batteries are very conservative because uh, it's a, I mean, Matt can correct me, but uh, we don't usually go from absolute 0% to absolute 100% in terms of like the state of charge. So there's always a, 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 a range in the middle that it uses for charging and discharging in order to keep the battery for a long time. So that might be another reason that it, it doesn't fall into a good, like, like a correlation or a curve. I'll take one last question and then uh, we're going to have to wrap it up. So the, uh, and I just want to say on that topic, I'd be a little nervous if the uh, battery that powered my car could fit in my pocket. I'm not sure whether I could uh, comfortably walk around with that. <laughs> Fantastic question around complex systems and uh, entrepreneurship and starting new companies in that area. Um, I would take a look at, well, first of all, who's your customer and how you segment the market and how you can add value to that customer. I, uh, in some ways, that seems like a bit of a trite answer, uh, but uh, that's what I would take a look at and also see if you can simplify your system. <laughs> and sort of maybe that's an extension of sort of my suggestion to focus on the orange is that. So, you know, we're combining data logging and predictive modeling to basically help dealerships sell more cars, right? It's, it's not historically, like, if I walked into a car dealership and said, you know, you and I should understand why MATLAB Simulink is useful for you, um, it's not gonna land, right? Um, but if you can say, look, you have eight out of 10 people leaving a dealership and six of those don't come back, I can bring back seven out of eight of those. Like that is a complex system and we're bringing the car buyer into that system. Um, so I, all I guess I could offer is that uh, all I have experienced is that everything is a complex system. And there's some really good opportunities in that if you can find the mappings that other people can't see. And, and perhaps, I don't know if you had a yeah, final comment. There's always opportunity for joint development. Like uh, for, for joint developments, like partnerships with other uh, companies. So the way the OMS uh, technology is, uh, is doing that is that we, I mean, we, we are a few thousand kilometers from Alberta, but we are developing a sensor for Alberta. So Maybe I, I, I can just end with the, the invitation, uh, you know, with my accelerator uh, center hat on, but also as the Associate Vice President of Research Commercialization here at the university, um, our Office of Research is here to help. And uh, when any of you have technology, ideas, and you want to really understand how you make the bridge from what you're working on to how that can turn into uh, viable uh, commercial entities. Uh, we are here to help, so I, I would extend that offer to uh, come and talk to us either at the Office of Research or at the Accelerator Center. You know, we'd certainly love to, uh, to hear about what you're working on and how that can potentially be turned into uh, uh, great commercial activity to solve some uh, very serious real world problems. With that, I'm going to have to wrap up our panel. I'd like to thank very much our, our panelists and uh, turn it back over to Zewen Chen uh, to close this off. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Um, like I said, um, we have a networking session um, between 10 and uh, 11 o'clock, and I would very much encourage you to uh, check out the poster sessions and displays. And uh, please come back at 11 o'clock where um, our executive director, Ian Rowlands, will be introduced in the second panel. So, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>